Good day, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. This session will begin at the top of the hour. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Small Scale Evaluation. I'm Miranda Lee, and I'm your host for today's webinar. With me here today is Lori Wingate, the Director of Evaluate. Evaluate is the Evaluation Support Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. We are located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. Elaine Kraft is also joining us today from Florence Darlington Technical College. Elaine is the director of the South Carolina ATE Center of Excellence and principal investigator for Mentor Connect. Please note that the views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters and they do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. Mike Lasecki, Janet Pinhorn, and Tim Suchomsky from Maytech at Maricopa Community Colleges are working behind the scenes to make sure today's webinar runs smoothly. We would also like to thank Mike Rudabaugh from Lakeland Community College and Charlotte Forrest from Mentor Connect for their help with this webinar. The materials that support today's webinar include the presentation slides, a handout of key points and resources, and a recording of the session. The handout and slides are already on our website, and there is also a link to the materials on the right-hand side of your screen. We will send you an email with those links and with a link to the webinar recording as soon as that becomes available. Today's webinar is divided into three main sections. After each section, we will check in with Elaine Kraft for her Tales from the Trenches, real-life stories that focus on each piece of webinar content. We will also answer audience questions during a question and answer break after each section. So if you have a question at any time during our webinar today, simply type it in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I will keep track of them, and we will answer them during one of those breaks. If the question is specifically for Lori or Elaine, please include their name with your question so I can make sure to address them to the right person. And now, without further ado, I will turn today's webinar over to Lori. Well, thanks, Miranda, and welcome, everyone. In this first part of the webinar, I'm going to set the stage for the content we're going to cover regarding small project evaluation. But first, I have a couple more housekeeping items. Whenever you see a color border on the slide like this, it means you're going to be asked to do something. So in just a moment, not quite yet, a poll will appear on the screen. But first, I need to set up the question by telling you just a short story of how we're able to bring this webinar to you today. The National Science Foundation funds Evaluate, that's our support center, and because of that funding, we are able to put on free webinars like this one for you. And all we ask in return is for you to give us one thing, and that's going to be the topic of our first poll question. And because if you give us this very special thing that only you can give us, we're able to provide NSF with evidence of the quality uh, and impact of our webinars. And if that evidence shows that the investment's been worthwhile, it's more likely that NSF will give us money to continue this work. And just as importantly, we use that special resource that only you possess to improve what we do. So now it's time for that poll question, which should appear on your slide momentarily. Um, so what's the one thing that we'd like you to give us in return for this free webinar? Consider your choices and just so select the button uh, that corresponds to your answer, and we'll see how things turn out. You guys in suspense? I am. Although it looks like a landslide, right? Wonderful. So most of you selected feedback. We will accept your solemn oaths of fealty and your likes on Facebook, um, but feedback was the correct answer. So please stick around to the end of the webinar and complete our very, very short survey. So this webinar is designed for individuals involved from 
the, with the NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program. But a lot of what you will hear today will be relevant to small project evaluation in a variety of contexts. But just a little bit on the ATE program, its purpose is to increase the quality and quantity of technicians who work in high-tech fields that drive the U.S. economy. It mainly funds two-year colleges to operate projects, centers, and research. And as you can see, there's lots of different types of efforts funded within these tracks. Our focus today is on the evaluation of small projects, which are funded through a program track called Small Grants for Institutions New to ATE, kind of a mouthful. Two things distinguish these projects from others within the ATE program. First is eligibility uh, is limited to community college that have not had an ATE ward in the past 10 years, and the funding is limited to up to $200,000 over three years. And although the success rate changes from year to year depending on the number and the quality of the proposal submissions, about 60% of ATE small grant proposals are funded, which is much higher, it's a much higher rate than for the overall ATE program and NSF in general. And a strong evaluation plan uh, for a small project proposal will further enhance its chances of getting funded. When this topic of small project evaluation comes up, the first question I'm usually asked is, well, what is the difference between evaluating a small project and a large project? And I have my standard answer, but I think I want to, we're going to focus in on this issue of scale in general before we get to the answer. So here we have two Lego sets. So those of you who are Star Wars fans will immediately recognize this as Han Solo's Millennium Falcon. Non-Star Wars fans, don't worry, you'll still get the point of this. So these images represent the same spaceship built on two different scales. Now in considering the similarities, you might notice that they're made from the same basic components, uh, they have the same basic form, and they're representing the same, the same specific ship. And considering the smaller, the differences on the small side, it has fewer components, it takes less time to make, and it's less expensive. Likewise, the larger set has many components, takes more time to make, and it's more expensive. So the basic components, the building blocks, if you will, are the same, and they're put together to serve the same basic form and function. But there's a big difference and the level of complexity, the cost, and the required time and effort. And the same is true for the evaluation of small projects and of large projects. So the level of effort and resources required is quite different, but the basic components and the basic general form and function are going to be the same. Now the common dictionary definition of evaluation is the determination of something's quality, value, or importance. And that's the core function of evaluation, regardless of scale. When we're talking about project evaluation, we're really talking about doing this systematically and with the support of evidence. To do this, first we have to clearly identify what will be evaluated. And we can do this by framing key questions about a project's processes and outcomes. Then we gather evidence so we can answer those questions with confidence and validity. And although many will stop there, we need to push on and interpret those data and actually answer the evaluation questions. And there's really no point in doing any of this if the information isn't going to be used. So it's really criti critical to actually use the evaluation results for things like accountability to sponsors, to improve our work, and to plan next steps. And we can use what we learn in that process um, to start the whole cycle over again as we venture into new initiatives. So I want to introduce you to Kevin Little. He, su proposed, uh, he submitted a proposal to us for a small ATE grant uh, last fall to develop an injection molding certificate program at Smallsville Community College. And he was recently contacted by NSF and informed that his project proposals received generally positive reviews, but the reviewers weren't satisfied with the evaluation plan. And the evaluation plan in his proposal was nearly non-existent, as you can see here, simply stating that the project would be evaluated using surveys of students conducted by the project director. And in fact, I recently saw an evaluation plan very similar to this in a proposal to a different pr kind of program. So although the sparseness of this plan may shock you, especially those of you who work in evaluation, I assure you it does happen. So Kevin has been asked to submit a revised evaluation plan and budget, and we're going to help him through that process. So I'd like you to use the chat box now um, to the right of the slide 
to give Kevin some advice about where to start, what's the very first thing he should do before he goes back to the drawing board for the evaluation of his project? Okay, Samantha setting, saying getting clear on goals, that would be very important. Determining outcomes, see a lot of focus on goals and outcomes, okay. Developing a logic model, that's great advice. Okay, Alberto saying read the solicitation, excellent. So a lot of really good advice coming coming through and I imagine it'll keep coming through as I move on, um, but, but excellent. So that is in fact my, my, for, my advice is to go back to that program solicita solicitation and read it. So the program solicitation is a document that lays out what the program is all about and includes guidelines for what should be addressed in a proposal. Now in the section on evaluation in the ATE solicitation, it says that all ATE projects have to be evaluated and there has to be an independent evaluator involved. So that's a cue that we're gonna have to get in, that into the budget, right? So it also says the evaluation budget should match the scope of the evaluation. In the section on intellectual merit, which is one of the review criteria for NSF, it says the evaluation should be tied to project outcomes. And many of you uh, focused in on clarifying outcomes. So that's very in line with uh, what you would, would get if you went back to the solicitation. Um, it also notes the evaluation should provide useful information. Now for proposers who've had previous previous NSF funding. It says they need to discuss the results from prior support, including evidence of project impact. So that's something our new friend Kevin wants to keep in mind for the future. He'll want to collect good evidence about this project so he can use it in his next proposal. But the solicitation does not tell us how much to spend on evaluation. And that's often the first question a proposer asks with regard to evaluation. I get a lot of calls, and that's the first question I get. We have this project, it needs an evaluation, how much will it cost? Well, I will tell you the rule of thumb, and this is very general, is that 10% of a project's cost should be allocated for evaluation. So that's a good place to start. Now, of course, you can go up or down from there, depending on what level of evaluation is needed for a project. So that's just a, guide, a general play, starting place. Now, I want to caution you here. So I'm going to be using, in the next few slides, actual dollar amounts and time allocations for evaluation. But please understand this is just for illustrative purposes only to show you the process of budgeting for an evaluation for, for a project that has a, has a fixed budget. Um, these are absolutely not to be construed as recommendations or guidelines for evaluator costs or time commitments, okay? So just please bear that in mind as we proceed to the next few slides. So here we have the project budget. And the total direct costs for implementing this project add up to $100,039,100. Okay, so those, those first four categories are the costs to implement the project. Now if we take 10% of that, it comes out to $13,910. And that's gonna bring our direct costs for this project to just a little more than $153,000. Then we add in our indirect costs. Now for Kevin's College, that's 30%. It may be a, a lot higher or lower at your institutions. You may call this something different, maybe overhead or facilities and administrative costs. Um, but that's gonna bring us to just about $200,000 for over three years. So what is that almost $14,000 over three years going to get us for the evaluation. Well, first we need to set aside some money for the evaluator to make one site visit per year. And note that this evaluator is apparently within driving distance because clearly $500 would not be enough to cover air travel and other, and lodging and all that. Then we need to know how we need to know what the external evaluator's rate is. And this is important because you do need to specify this in an NSF budget and budget justification. I'm using $100 per hour here just as because it's easy. Again, this is not intended as a guideline. Um, so how many days can the external evaluator devote to this project? Well, as you can see, I've put in a few more days a few more, a little bit more time in year one to have a little, to allow for additional work to get the evaluation fully planned and off the ground. 
So here we have six days allocated in year one, five days in year two, and four and a half days in year three. So you can see this really isn't a lot of time on the part of the external evaluator. So what advice can we give Kevin for how he can stretch those evaluation dollars to get the most bang for his buck? Um, so use the chat box now to share your ideas. How can we stretch our evaluation dollars for this small project? Chuck is suggesting online surveys, definitely less expensive than paper and pencil surveys, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Goldie's uh, suggesting in-kind. Ashley's pointing out, use an evaluator close by, right? If you're going to fly somebody across the country, you're going to, it's going to eat up your budget really fast. Using interns. Jason's saying, you utilize program staff to help with data collection. Excellent. A lot of really, really good ideas. And um, very similar to many things that I came up with as well. And in the rest of this webinar, we're going to be touching on three main points. First and foremost, Kevin needs to make sure that he matches the scale of his evaluation to the scale of the project. And he'll want to select methods that will produce data needed to address the evaluation questions, but they're also feasible on a limited budget. So we're going to choose lower cost methods. And finally, uh, with the external evaluator spending just a few days per year on this project, the project team is definitely going to need to be involved in monitoring the project and helping to implement the evaluation. And we're going to get to those issues in a bit. And we do have a question break coming up. I saw a few questions flash by. Um, but first, we're going to hear from Elaine Kraft with her Tales from the Trenches. Elaine's worked with many ATE projects, big and small, over the years. And she has a wealth of experience to share. So go ahead, Elaine. Thanks, Lori. I would like to encourage our audience to think about efficiency as a way to stretch evaluation dollars with small projects. So what can a principal investigator do to improve the efficiency of project evaluation? Here's an example. Your evaluator needs to understand the context in which your project is being implemented. Since the focus of most ATE projects is on community colleges and their students, selecting an evaluator who has two-year college experience and has evaluated ATE projects previously saves a lot of time, not only at the beginning, but throughout the evaluation. An evaluator who has worked in the two-year college world will automatically understand more about your students, the way two-year colleges operate, than someone who hasn't. This prior knowledge and experience makes it possible to move ahead quickly with project-specific evaluation work. Another way to work efficiently is by using technology to communicate and transfer information. The project team can take photos on a smartphone and text or email them to the evaluator making sure, of course, that they have secured permission to take and share photos of participants. They can also scan and email handwritten meeting notes, sign-in sheets from events, and other documents not readily available in electronic files. I find that making a practice of transferring information as events happen keeps your evaluator informed and minimizes reporting time. Shared cloud storage, like Dropbox or perhaps Google Docs, also helps. One last suggestion to improve efficiency is to be prompt and responsive to evaluator requests. I just love it when a project team responds before follow-up becomes necessary. As a principal investigator, keep in mind that your evaluator's time is a scarce resource, and it's better to have the evaluator doing new work for you then following up on previous requests for information, data, or potential meeting times. Now to you, Miranda. OK, thanks, Elaine. So we've reached our first question and answer break. If you do have questions, please type them now, and we'll address our first question. So uh, this question would be for Lori. Lori, are the standards that are used to judge small-scale or project evaluations the same as other evaluations? Um, so my opinion on that matter is absolutely. So if you're referring to the program evaluation standards, we're looking uh, for evaluations to be useful, feasible, um, ethical, which is the propriety standards, and accurate, 
and have a high degree of accountability. So what, ha what, what we see in the difference between small and large evaluations is that you end up making different kinds of trade-offs among those standards. There's always trade-offs among the standards. So you know with a smaller scale evaluation that feasibility is going to be prioritized because there's very limited budgets. You can only do what you can do with your resources. Whereas in a larger scale evaluation, we may see those accuracy standards sort of bubbling up and import, more importance because um, there aren't as much strength uh, on, the, on resources um, as with a smaller project. If others want to chime in on that, you can have a conversation about it in the chat box. Thank you. Our next question. Do evaluators need to be pre-approved or known by NSF? Could we ask someone from our local four-year university to be an evaluator if that person or institute has not been a prior NSF grant evaluator? And Lori, I think that question is for you. Um, Esther, there is no pre-approved list of evaluators from NSF, so I wouldn't uh, waste your time looking for one. And you definitely can ask someone from your local university to be an evaluator. Um, definitely what you want to show if you write that person into your proposal, is that they have the right experience and competence. So you want to pick someone that's done evaluation work before, preferably someone who's done um, evaluations of NSF-funded projects. Uh, as other people have noted, and Elaine would, I'm sure, concur, it's nice to have someone who has experience in ATE, because then you aren't going to have to spend a lot of time explaining ATE in the two-year college context to them. But you're, with, with regard to your question, absolutely can ask somebody from your local university. Thank you. So what type of projects are usually funded through NSF grants, Lori? Um, I will ask uh, folks who are interested in that to, and maybe someone can type this, Marion, or maybe you could type in the chat box. No, I can do it. NSF.gov, I'm typing now, slash ATE, uh, to learn more about the ATE program. And Elaine, it, maybe Elaine would like to say just a little bit about the types of projects funded through ATE as well. Um, ATE projects cover um, everything from curriculum development to faculty development. There is a research track as well. Um, so it's really the whole gambit of things that uh, could lead to improved uh, preparation of technicians for the workforce, pathways for those technicians to come from high school into the two-year colleges. Um, Pathways into the four-year are important, but generally are not uh, considered a good focus for an ATE project. Thank you. So I think we have one more question. How do I know when the eval is the right scale for the project, not too much or not too little? Lori? Well, Goldie, I would say that um, that's really going to come in when you really start honing in on your evaluation questions and your data collection. So you want to, it's kind of an iterative process, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the second section of the webinar, but you identify what it is that should be evaluated, and then you start really drilling down what data we need to figure, to answer these evaluation questions, how is it going to be collected. So if you find yourself stretching quite thin to be able to answer questions, chances are your scale's too big. If you find yourself saying, hey, we could look at that, we could look at this, why don't we do a survey over there, then you're, pro you're probably just filling, uh, filling the space, um, and you need to either ask more complex questions or or your project doesn't need quite the budget and resources that maybe you allocated. OK, thank you. So that comes to the end of our first question and answer break. And I would like to turn it over to Lori. Uh, so thank you, Lori. Well, thank you for all those great questions. Keep them coming. This part of the webinar is about getting the scale of the evaluation right for this small project. So it does speak to Goldie's question. Um, and that's the probably the most important piece of advice for maximizing a small evaluation budget is getting the scale right. So let's go ahead and get to work planning the evaluation for this small ATE project. First, I'll tell you more about the project by sharing the project abstract with you. So growth in manufacturing in the Smallsville region has led to high demand for plastic injection molding technicians. And injection molding is the process used for manufacturing things like Lego plastic Lego parts, car dashboards, certain medical devices. So to address this growing demand, Smallsville Community College is developing a certificate in plastic injection molding. And this certificate's a credential that will have immediate value in the local labor market. 
program will be designed with input from an advisory committee comprised of 10 representatives from local manufacturers, and five existing technology and engineering courses will be updated based on the advisor's input on how to better align the courses with employer needs. In addition, there's a new course that will be developed called Essential Workplace Skills, and it's um, focused on developing students' communication, teamwork, and critical thinking skills. To help with marketing the program, a promotional video will be developed by the college's videography students, and that video will be aired in a variety of venues, and the certificate program also will be represented at the local education for employment fair for like local high school students. Once it is well established, it's expected that the program will award certificates to 20 students per year. So here's that project abstract I shared with you. This is a fictional project, but it's typical of what you might see proposed as a small grant to the ATE program, albeit minus a lot of important details, right? We want to keep this simple. I want you to be familiar with this project because we're going to be working with it for the rest of the webinar. So I recommend developing a logic model to really bring the key elements of a project into relief to help plan the evaluation. And this will also help make sure that there's a realistic vision for what a small project can achieve. So speaking of that realistic vision, based on what you know about this project so far, um, there's going to be a poll on the screen. And I would like you to pick which of the options you think is best to describe an ambitious yet realistic long-term outcome for this project. So scan those choices and just click the, the button next to your favorite option. Wow, we have 267 people on this webinar, so it takes a little while for everybody to register their answers. I see they're coming through. Okay, so not many of you are picking the second option, a more region, robust regional economy. You're clearly recognizing this as a little bit out of the scope of what this small project can do. And most of you are honing in on that third option. You might see that a lot of these, many of these are relevant but that capable injection molding workforce that meets regional demands is really the key outcome that this project is working towards. So it's the need that it was designed to address. So that is definitely the right choice. So a logic model is a way of visually communicating a project's key activities and outcomes. Now many logic models, if not most, will also include project inputs, so at the far uh, left and outputs right after activities. But we're keeping this just really simple for the purposes of this webinar. So basically a logic model is a concise visual depiction of what a project's going to do and what changes it's trying to bring about. And if outcomes haven't been well articulated through the proposal development process, creating a logic model can really spur thinking about outcomes and how they will actually come about. So we're going to create a logic model for Kevin's project. First column in this logic model is for activities. So activities are just simply what a project does to bring about intended outcomes. So what are this project's main activities? So here's that abstract if you want to scan it again, and you can use the chat box to list what you see as the key activities. Okay, Fred has noted developing the five courses in the curriculum, definitely. Uh, Peggy's noting updating the courses. Yep, you're focusing on developing those courses. Uh, Mr. Tester says they're going to need to attract students. Yep. Creating the courses. Esther's noting marketing as well as Ellen. That's right. Good. And these are usually the most straightforward thing to get into a logic model. Of course, there's many other things that would go into implementing a project, right? You know, you have management, administrative, outreach, evaluation, all these things. But here are the core activities that really are intended to directly bring about the outcomes. And these are convening that advisory panel, revising the courses, creating the new course, and marketing the program. And you guys honed right in on those. 
Now next in the logic model are outcomes. So these are changes brought about through project activities. Uh, like this one, most logic models articulate three levels of outcomes, short, mid, and long term. The most important thing to understand about outcomes in a logic model is that they are about changes in things like knowledge, skills, attitudes, behaviors, and so on. So the focus here should be about changes related to the need the project is addressing. They aren't just the project's activities that happen to occur late in the project, okay? This isn't about what projects do, it's about what difference they make in the world. All right, we already agree that this project's long-term outcome uh, should be this capable injection molding workforce. So I've just put it right in there, there's no mystery there. Now we need to connect the dots between the activities and this desired long-term outcome. So use your chat box to identify short-term outcomes uh, that the activities could help bring about that will move this project toward this long-term outcome. So these are things that will happen as a direct result of the project activities. Again, use your chat box. Okay, Vicki's noting increasing prospective student awareness, definitely. Students completing the courses, that will be important. Stephanie is importantly noting we do have to enroll students, yep. Okay, meeting of the advisory committee. The courses are developed. Okay, so you guys are really warm, you're so warm. So one thing, we wanna avoid things that are products. So a course, uh, is not a change in the world, it's a, it's a thing we created, it's a product. In and of itself, it won't create change in people. Um, and I also, it's not a hard and fast rule, I don't think there are any in logic models, but I also like to steer, steer people away from administrative activities or outcomes, so things about the project, not about the, the people affected. Um, I'll show you what I did. There's no real right and wrong answers here, but you, and you did all know a lot of reasonable things that would happen as a result of activities. But I figured that prospective students would need to learn about the program, right? And the new and improved courses would have to be delivered. So it's not enough to just design the, the courses, you know, people coming together and deciding what should be in those courses. They have to be uh, delivered in accordance with their new design. So these are outcomes here because they're changes in what people know and do, students and faculty in this case, so outside of the, the people who are running the project. It's changes uh, that occur in other people because of actions the project has taken. So what do we need to do to bridge the gap between the short and long-term outcomes? What needs to happen here? So again, this is the last one, use the chat box to identify one or two what you would call midterm outcomes that would link the short-term results to the desired long-term outcome. Okay, Maggie's pointing out students need to complete the program for sure. Yep, we're seeing students completing courses, completing certificates, students gaining skills, yeah. It's going by so fast I can hardly keep up, but it, I think you're honing right in on things. Um, and, and probably you guys can pay more attention to the chat than I can, but you can see there's a number of ways to describe midterm outcomes. Um, but I said here that students would have to successfully complete the courses and obtain those certificates. I think it's conceivable that some students could actually do the courses but not opt for the certificate, and that's an important piece of this. And then the certificate holding students will um, seek and obtain injection molding technicians jobs. So that's gonna support that long-term outcome of this capable workforce. So now we have a neat little logic model and we can use it to begin planning the project evaluation. Now our webinar handout has a link to a simple logic model template. Um, it has question prompts and ATE specific examples to help you build your own logic model. And creating a logic model is really helpful for getting clarity about what a project is doing and seeking to achieve. But our main purpose in doing this as part of an evaluation is to determine the project's evaluation questions and what we should be measuring. Now, I noted that the first step in the evaluation process is to clarify what the evaluation is going to address. And um, often we, we frame an evaluation's focus in terms of evaluation questions or objectives. 
So evaluation questions, which is my preference, but our objectives are okay. Questions are about projects, quality, effectiveness, importance, things like that. Um, questions that the evaluation will answer based on evidence, and they should address both a project's processes and outcomes. But whether framed as questions or objectives, statements about what the evaluation is going to address, they provide a foundation for the evaluation and established boundaries for the evaluation that help maintain focus on what matters. So Kevin's team has brainstormed a lot of possible evaluation questions, and we're going to help them pick the right ones for this project. A lot of them are going to seem relevant, but with limited resources, it's important to ask a few critical focus questions. Now, my colleague Daniela Schroeder and I authored a checklist of criteria for good evaluation questions. We just don't have time in the webinar to get into those, but I do recommend you look at the checklist when developing your own evaluation questions, and there's other resources to learn about evaluation questions on that checklist, um, and there's a link to that on the webinar handout. For now, we're going to use our collective common sense. So here's some possible, oops, I just gave away the answer, there we go. Um, possible evaluation questions. If you could just pick one of these for the external evaluation to address with regard to the project's activities, which one would you select? Okay, a high preference for option one. And no one's selecting, wants to know about supportive college administrators. Well, you may notice that a lot of these are relevant, right? But with, like you, I, we can let the poll go away. There we go. Um, I thought the question about alignment of courses to industry needs is the most important question we could ask at the activity level. Because if this part of the project isn't done well, it's not going to have much chance for success down the road. So again, a lot of possible questions, a lot of relevant issues we could explore, but this could be the most important thing that we could look at in the external evaluation. So likewise, if just one of these questions which are going to appear in just a moment, could be addressed in the external evaluation with regard to short-term outcomes, which would you select? A lot of folks honing in on the number of students. But this time we're getting some answers some selections across the board. Okay, so less certainty on this item. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to move ahead. All right, so my thought was that this question about whether the courses are being implemented as designed was important. Um, I think on the, the poll it was phrased a little bit differently. Are the courses being implemented with fidelity to their design? I think this is a very important to, thing to look at because if the project isn't, if this part of the project isn't executed well, then the project falls flat. If the, if the you know, you have lots of students signing up, but those, those improvements are not making it uh, in being implemented by the faculty and being delivered to students in the project, there's going to be a problem with the project. So finally, moving on to midterm outcomes, you know the drill now. If you could just pick one of these questions that are going to appear on your screen for the external evaluation regarding midterm outcomes, which would you choose? And this is the last time you'll be quizzed, I think. Okay, a lot more agreement here with folks going to that first option. Well over 100 of you have answered with about over 80% selecting that one. And I agree with you that this question, is, and it actually gets at both outcomes, the students getting the certificates and jobs, 
is really important one to address here. The project may actually may not get far enough along to have many students actually entering the job market. And if that were the case, we'd want to at least inve investigate their intent to pursue jobs in that area. So it really depends on how quickly the program gets up and running and getting students through the system. So our long-term outcome would be hard to establish in the short time frame of our project. Um, so I wouldn't recommend dedicating any of our limited evaluation budget to this question. Now, if another project is funded that builds on this one, um, then that project's evaluation could build on the results of this one and go further down the outcomes chain to gather evidence and determine the extent to which the project contributes to achieving this outcome. So now we have four evaluation questions, and we could probably wordsmith them. Um, maybe there's other important issues that could be addressed. And that's why in a real life project, this process of identifying and negotiating evaluation questions should be a collaborative process. And then I noted earlier, we should be asking both process and outcome questions. And you can see we've got good coverage here. So Kevin is happy that we were able to help him sift through all those questions and get his evaluation to a manageable scale that his budget can handle. So we've worked through that piece that first piece of advice, and then in the rest of the webinar, we'll consider those other two uh, recommendations. Um, but now we're going to hear from Elaine again. Thanks, Lori. One point I would like to make about evaluation plans is that they are dynamic rather than static. I find this particularly true with the project calendar. Things just don't always work out or occur when you intended. As your timeline or activities change, which is perfectly normal, it's really important to alert your evaluator of the change as soon as possible. Evaluation activities will need to be adjusted accordingly, and the more advanced warning you can give your evaluator, the better. You certainly don't want the evaluator spending time developing a survey for an event that is no longer even on your schedule. My last point is to encourage you to let evaluators do what they do best. For example, you may think it saves time if you prepare a survey to capture information from your participants. However, this isn't normally a good idea. Survey design is more complex than it appears, and your evaluator will know how to ensure that responses are of greatest value to the evaluation. It's just better and more efficient to let the evaluator develop surveys and other tools for evaluating your project. Another thing that happens is that changes to your project may be necessary during negotiations with NSF prior to receiving a grant award. Make certain that you tell your evaluator about any pre-funding changes from the original project work plan. For example, a number of small new to ATE projects are changed from a two-year to a three-year project prior to being funded. This can have a big impact on the project's annual budget and evaluation plan. The key, obviously, is good com and timely communication. Now, back to you, Miranda. Well, thank you, Elaine. So we're at our second question break. Remember, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. So. Lori, the first question that we have um, comes from our example um, earlier. And the person asked, uh, does course, could course delivery equal one of the outputs that you presented in the logic model example? Um, and I'm getting a share my screen screen. So if someone in Maytag could make me less anxious about that, that would be great. We're, so we're course delivery course. as an Okay, thanks. Um, so course delivery as an output, um, you know, I think outputs is the trickiest part of logic models. So I have my own kind of rule of thumb, but I know not everyone applies this. I, for me, outputs are always products. So my product from this webinar is not the, I wouldn't frame it as the delivery of the webinar. I would frame it as you have slides, you have handouts, you have recording, those are products and access. So if you've created a curriculum that's available for others to utilize, that's what I would frame as an output. Um, I would say course delivery is, a, is an activity. If you're looking at faculty making changes to how they teach, I would frame that as an outcome. I think the most important thing with logic models is to apply your own definitions of what these categories mean and be consistent with them. So, in, you know, not being inconsistent in how you 
how you define and how you present outputs versus outcomes, which apply your own uh, standard consistently. I shared how I did it, and I think pe people do it lots of ways, and I think the most important thing is to be consistent in how you do it within a logic model. Okay, thanks, Lori. So the second question that we have is, do you put options for questions in front of the stakeholders like you did in your polls, or are they typically co-created? Well, I wouldn't go into a group of stakeholders and say, here's four questions. Please pick one of these. I wouldn't do that. You know, we're doing that sort of artificial situations webinar. I do think co-creation is definitely the way you want to go and really negotiating and finding out what's the most important thing, working with them to, to make sure the questions are feasible. I do think a lot of stakeholders need education about what evaluation questions are. I think a lot of people hear that phrase, and they think it means the questions on a survey. I run into that a lot. Um, I think sometimes I've seen folks gravitate to, to numbers. How many of this? How many of that? When did that happen? So things that are easy, easily captured. So there may need to be some education around what, what an evaluation question really is, what purpose it serves, and around that to facilitate dialogue and decision making as a group on what the evaluation question should be. Okay. With a limited budget, how do you strike a balance between stating long-range outcomes and acknowledging that you can't measure them within the life of the project? Well, again, I may not, I may have a different view on this than others, and I think that's okay. I think your long-term outcome should be closely aligned with the need you are addressing in your project. So if you're, if you're addressing a project, it's to solve some kind of, typically some kind of problem in the space in which you work or some kind of issue or maximize some kind of opportunity. So if that's the premise for the project, I like to see outcomes framed in those terms. Now, if you have a two to three year project and you know that you can't get to that long-term outcome that you're trying to address, personally, I think it's okay to put it in your logic model. Sometimes I've put like a dotted line, like this is what we're pushing towards, but we know we're not going to get there in this time frame. But then lots of times you have another, uh, you know, infusion of funding and you can get closer to that. Um, but don't, I mean, the thing about the evaluation is don't overstretch yourself. Like if you know that's not going to happen in your time frame, it's just not realistic to expend your evaluation resources on trying to measure it. One final quick question, Lori, before we move to the next section. Is the logic model itself required attachment with the NSF AT small grants proposal? Logic models are not required for ATE proposals. They are required for some ATE, I mean, excuse me, NSF programs, but not the ATE program. We evaluate, recommend it, because we think it's such a good tool for communicating what your project is trying to do, as well as sort of mapping out the evaluation. But it is not required. Okay, thank you. So keep your questions coming in the chat box, and we will answer questions at the end. For now, um, I would like to turn it back over to Lori. Okay, again, thank you all. All the great questions really make me think hard. So this is the last section of the webinar. It's going to be a little bit shorter, and it's focused on how to collect data that will enable us to answer the evaluation questions in a feasible way. Since I'm often asked how involved project staff can be in an evaluation, I'm also going to address that issue in this section. So we're going to dive into step two of the evaluation process, which is about gathering evidence to answer the evaluation questions. For a small project, it's especially important to use data collection and analysis methods that will get us the data that's necessary to answer the evaluation questions and that are feasible on a small budget. And on that note, choosing lower cost methods was our second piece of advice for Kevin. So here's some pretty common methods in project evaluation, certainly not an exhaustive list, but typical. So relatively speaking, use the chat box to say which of these things you think are more costly than the others. Megan is noting focus groups. Ellen's noting observations. We're getting a lot of focus groups, paper and pencil surveys. You guys are honing right in on them. Exactly. You got it. So we don't have to 
the labor this too much, but relatively speaking, the methods I've highlighted here, which are the same ones you're putting in the chat box, are probably going to be more expensive than the others. And it's no coincidence that three of those four methods uh, were qualitative. So qualitative data collection, especially the analysis of qualitative data, is just very time consuming. And as you know, in this context, time really is quite literally money. The reason paper and pencil surveys are relatively more costly than electronic surveys, and I don't think this is going to surprise any of you, it's because of the added time required uh, for data entry as well as for verification, because manual data entry is also, we're more prone to make mistakes. It just takes more time. The big difference between structured and unstructured interviews is that the open-ended nature of an unstructured interview um, requires very time-consuming in-depth qualitative analysis. So in a very structured interview process, you're seeking very specific pieces of information, so it's more straightforward uh, to analyze. It takes a lot less time. So the methods here that I've highlighted are going to be less costly. I will know, however, that a document review can become unwieldy if it's done in a kind of open-ended way, exploratory way. So a document review can be efficient if you're looking for, again, very specific pieces of information. So with feasibility in mind, the next step is to develop a data collection plan for addressing these evaluation questions. We're going to work through two of these questions, so we just don't have time to get to all of them. So let's look at question one, to what degree are the new and improved courses aligned with industry needs? There's really no way we can answer this question with quantitative data, right? We have to use a qualitative process. And you'll see I've suggested two indicators for addressing this question. The first one pretty much mirrors the question itself. It's the degree to which the new course content matches the industry panel's recommendations. So in the data sources and methods column, the second column, I'll try to highlight that here. I can't use my pointer. Um, we've noted that this will be done by comparing the panel's recommendations with the revised course syllabi. So we have two documents, and we're going to review them side by side. And as noted in the third column, the external evaluator is going to have responsibility for this task. Now, the second indicator, there, I can use my pointer now. Um, it's just a different way of getting at this. This is the it's about the opinions of the industry advisors on the degree of alignment. And this will be done through structured interviews with the advisors conducted by the external evaluator. So we have just two indicators for that first question. So for question four, how effective is the program in terms of producing qualified injection molding technicians? Um, if you review these, you'll notice the first two indicators are quantitative and the third one is qualitative. And they're utilizing three different data sources, and they all involve cooperation between the external evaluator and project staff. So the takeaway from this in the previous slide isn't the specific information in the cells. Really, I just I'm illustrating this, this matrix, this table, as a strategy for identifying what data will be collected and how and by whom to answer the evaluation questions. Um, so creating a table like this really helps in creating a, a feasible and comprehensive data collection plan and making sure you can actually answer your questions. So there's two resources on our webinar handout that offer help in this area, uh, a data collection planning matrix sort of template, especially for ATE, and a checklist for high-performing indicators, which was created by Goldie McDonald, who is on this webinar with us and asking excellent questions, by the way. This final piece of advice for Kevin, uh, is for the project team to be involved in doing some of the evaluation tasks themselves. So what are some ways in which a project team might assist an external evaluator? This, you guys came up with, many of you came up with this recommendation in the, in the first uh, beginning of the webinar about how to reduce costs. So what are some specific ways a project team can get involved in an evaluation to reduce costs? Okay, Courtney and Vicki are both pointing out, as well as Heather, to be involved in collecting the data. So the, the legwork and in collecting the data, definitely. Uh, yeah, so Mr. Tester is suggesting providing lists of stakeholders. So yeah, facilitating access to informants, another good uh, thing that project staff really are best positioned to do. 
Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of, like, helping with the legwork of, of data entry, facilitating the work, definitely. All really good ideas and pretty consistent with what I came up with, which has highlighted in white the external evaluator responsible for the more technical side of things, and this is consistent with what Elaine was saying earlier. And the project team uh, can assist with documenting, with data collection, as many of you noted, as well as just documenting who engages with the project and what the project does. And in the middle, you can see there's shared responsibility for planning the evaluation and interpreting the results. And this isn't just about resource efficiency. It's really about also about making sure the evaluation is relevant to the key stakeholders. Now, with regard to data collection, the evaluator, as Elaine noted, should lead the development of data collection instruments as well as the analysis of results. But the project team can certainly assist in the data collection process. And the project team really is in the best position to keep track of who's involved. And this is important from an accountability perspective. Uh, it doesn't make sense for an external evaluator to try to track this from a distance. And regardless of evaluation questions, the documentation of who is involved is really imperative for all projects. Uh, NSF grantees need this information on who is engaging with their project for reports to uh, NSF annually, as well as for in the ATE program, the ATE annual survey. And we have links on our webinar handout to learn more about those. The external evaluator can, of course, help the project team set up a spreadsheet or database to capture this information. You want to track information like key demographics, their contact information, the nature of their involvement. And then it's pretty easy to report on the types of people involved and, and how they're involved. And likewise, the project staff should maintain a record of activities and accomplishments. We've been doing this at Evaluate since 2009 through our project resume. Um, basically, it's a record of our funding, staffing, everything we've done, and everyone who's contributed to our work. And again, our webinar handout has some links to learn more about that. We've covered steps one and two in the overall process, and these are the most important parts of an evaluation plan from a funder's perspective, so that's why I've focused the webinar on these aspects. To complete the evaluation cycle, we'd also need to interpret the data and answer those questions and use the information, and Elaine has a good example of that coming up. So it's time to say goodbye to our new friend, Kevin. He's feeling pretty good. He's got an uh, sound evaluation questions and a feasible data collection plan. And he's well positioned to get his evaluation underway and have good evidence of his results for his next proposal. And we also have a checklist um, link on our handout about writing up your results from prior NSF support in your next proposal. And now we're here from Elaine briefly before we have our last question. Thanks, Lori. It's important to understand that evaluation can and should inform changes in a project to achieve or improve desired outcomes. I once worked with a GIS project whose project plan was to prepare high school teachers to teach a dual credit GIS course to improve the pathway and success rate for students entering the college GIS program. The original plan was to host a week-long workshop for two distinct cohorts of high school teachers, one in the first summer and one in the second summer of the project. Upon conclusion of the first summer workshop, however, feedback from the participants indicated that they had learned a lot in one week of training, but did not yet feel confident to teach the dual credit course. The teachers indicated that they needed to practice what they had learned during the coming year, and then have an opportunity to ask questions and receive more instruction, preferably by returning for another workshop the following summer. Based on this feedback, the principal investigator asked his NSF program officer to approve a change in scope of the project to work longer and in greater depth with one cohort of teachers rather than bringing in a second cohort as planned. This change was approved as it increased the likelihood that the dual credit course would actually be taught by teachers qualified and competent to teach it, whereas if two cohorts of teachers were inadequately prepared, the course would not likely be taught at all, and the goal of the project would not have been achieved. The important takeaway here is that with NSF projects, you have the latitude to make changes based on your evaluation data to guide better project outcomes. In fact, NSF expects you to do this. Now, back to you, Miranda. 
Okay, thank you, Elaine. So this brings us to our final question break. And we have a lot of questions to cover, so we'll just dive right in. Lori, some institutions, by state statute, are unable to work with the evaluator prior to funding. What recommendations would you have uh, to at least indicate an institution's understanding of the importance of evaluation? And how do you indicate that uh, without committing to a specific evaluator? Yeah, I have good advice on that um, already written up, so I won't spend time on it now. But if we can make sure we have that person's name, um, I can email that person. We can also put it in the follow-up. But I do, I do lay out because it, it is a problem that people face, and I have, I do have some suggestions for it. It's just not enough time to get into right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question um, is, can you discuss the potential role of an internal evaluator working with an external evaluator and how that could assist, especially in the budget for evaluation? Yeah, there's often a point person on a project that, that, that for evaluation. So they can serve as the liaison but, uh, between the project and the external evaluator. They can fil facilitate on-site data collection. For example, if there was a student survey and you want to do it electronically because it's cheaper but you want good response rates, um, perhaps that person could go to the classroom and say, OK, we're going to do this electronic surveys. Use your phones, or here I have some computers, and, and sort of facilitate that way. Um, gathering documents and providing those. Someone asked about data entry. I personally am not that skeptical about uh, a project doing their own data entry, but I know from externally that there can be perceived credibility issues. So you could have a situation where the internal person was entering the data, and then the, the external evaluator is, you know, picking a few random ones and checking the, the accuracy of the data entry, you can kind of balance it that way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so does small scale evaluation mean that there will not be follow-ups or pre or post evals? There won't be follow-up after the funding period. Um, you can have pre and post as long as that, you know, it supports your evaluation question and it's done within the bounds of the project. But in terms of before a project starts and then well after, that's typically you're not going to be able to fit that in, in uh, you know, if, if the evaluation has to be conducted within the, the timeline of the project. Um, but then again, that could be set up if the evaluator could work with the project to, to facilitate that data collection uh, after the project's over if they have that interest in doing that. How do you typically educate stakeholders about options for questions? Um, well, in mo most of my own personal experience, it's, it's, they, it has been turned over to me uh, to develop the questions. So it's me developing the questions and then presenting options, and then we have conversation about it. If, if I was going into a situation and, and we really wanted to start together from uh, sort of base from nothing, I would present what the purpose of an evaluation question, some examples of evaluation questions. I think a really good strategy is what we did in this webinar. Obviously, I think it's a good idea. It's my idea, um, is to present a logic model and say, we want to have questions, if at all feasible, if it fits with what stakeholders need to know. Ideally, we'd like to have questions across this logic model. So let's use the logic model as a springboard to discuss what we want to know and need to know at each point of the logic model. And that also will help us hone in on, uh, on what data could be collected at each stage. OK, thank you, Laurie. And we have one final question, and then uh, we'll proceed to the survey. Uh, how do you answer these all these questions with these methods in just such a short time span? And how do I answer that question in, with no time left? That's a good question. I think you really have to, the evaluator has to minimize the amount of the verbosity of their reporting. The reporting needs to be extremely succinct and to the point. And that's one way. Um, another way is to balance, is to trade off who's doing what. And I think if you, if you go back and look at the um, questions that, not all of those questions would be, evaluation questions would be addressed every year in this project. So we're focusing not, and that, and that helps use our resources more efficiently. So we're looking at one or two questions this year, and then, and so on. So we're not trying to do everything all at once. And I've seen a lot of people want that information about what to do if you can't name an evaluator. So we will just include that in the follow-up email. So let's bring up the, the survey link, because I think we're kind of over time now. Now remember, you all know how important this is, so 
click on that link on your screen, and that's the very, very short feedback survey. Sorry, Miranda. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I got very excited about our next uh, webinar, which is Outcome Evaluation Step-by-Step -step on March 22nd, 2017, from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern. So you can register for that by going to www.evalue-ate.org forward slash webinars and you will see the tile for outcome evaluation. Click on that and you can access the registration link. So we are taking the survey. Take time to fill that out and then while you're done or while you're completing the survey, I would like to take this opportunity to um, thank you for joining us today on behalf of Evaluate and on behalf of the folks at Mentor Connect. I hope that you enjoyed the webinar, and if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to us at www.evaluate.org. There is a contact form uh, on the website. Okay, thank you, and have a great day.